Cody Nestor arrived at Riverside Storage five minutes early for his 11 p.m. shift. The overnights were slowly killing him, but if he ever wanted to go back to school and have a shot at a better career, they were necessary. Cody's first security gig came right after high school, catching crowd surfers and ejecting drunks from the underground live venue downtown. When he turned 21, he worked as a mall cop by day and a bouncer by night. He lived that way for seven years, unable to find time for any social relationships, let alone dating. Now 28, living in a slum apartment and completely alone, Cody was determined to elevate his circumstances at any cost. His opportunity came at least in part in the form of a job offer. Cody's former supervisor, Mark Fryer, took a position with Brick Security, who managed security for Riverside Storage, and offered him the overnight guard shift. Riverside is a premium facility, charging much higher rates than its alternatives, largely due to its around-the-clock, on-site security personnel. Riverside units cost more than double what a standard storage unit costs, but the expense covers peace of mind. It also covered a healthy enough hourly rate for Cody to quit his other jobs and dedicate his spare time to applying for colleges and looking for other opportunities. Cody quickly discerned the sorts of items Riverside's clients stored there. Hand-carved furniture, sculptures, paintings, and the like. Of course, there was also the usual overflow of personal belongings that ended up there as well, but at any given time, at least 150 of the 267 sheds contained at least one asset worth five figures. After taking over from the second shift guard, Cody settled into the security office for the night. He selected a long podcast, cracked open a Diet Coke, and sat down in front of the monitors. Company policy stated that the guard on duty must perform a patrol once every 90 minutes, and the second shift guard had finished his last patrol shortly before Cody arrived, so he had some time to kill. At a glance, most of the monitors looked like a spot-the-difference activity. The five rows of storage units appeared eerily similar to one another on screen. The only monitor which appeared different showed the front gate, which was at all times supposed to remain closed. Customers received fobs which signaled the gate to open as soon as their vehicles approached it. They were technically allowed to access their units at any time, day or night. However, Cody had been instructed to check in on anyone who came by overnight and watch them closely. In the corner of his eye, the gate monitor caught Cody's attention just as his podcast was starting to get interesting. He paused it and turned toward the screen. A black pickup truck had just arrived at the gate, but it wasn't opening which meant the driver either forgot his fob or did not have one. Cody reached for the intercom. Can I help you? He asked. He watched the truck's window roll down, and a hand reached out to press the talkback button. Distorted by static, the male driver replied, I need a unit, a storage unit, just for the night. Cody rolled his eyes. Sorry, man. New unit rentals are only handled during business hours by a customer service representative. I'm only a security guard. If you want, I can take down your name and... On the screen, he noticed the man hanging out of the truck's window was shouting something at the speaker. Cody said, I'm really sorry, sir. You have to hold the button down if you want to talk. I can't hear you. The abrupt sound of the man's barking voice halfway through a sentence broke through on Cody's end. Can't help me. Nobody can. I just need a place to store something for one night, and it's very important that it's kept safe. Please, I don't have anywhere else to go, and I can't keep it with me. I'll pay. Whatever the normal rate is, I'll double it. Look, Cody replied when he could get a word in. Even if I was willing to bend the rules, I don't have access to the rental system. I don't even work for Riverside, technically. The company I work for just contracts with them. You're not hearing me, the man said. He looked up, directly into the security camera, and waved an unsealed envelope at it through his window. For emphasis, he opened the envelope and rifled through what Cody assumed were large bills. It's just for one night, man. How much is it going to cost? The man asked. Cody struggled to answer. 
His louder, more conscientious voice told him to turn the man away, but a quieter, more forceful voice spoke to him of his dreams and aspirations and of his lack of financial resources to get him there. This voice was, for some odd reason, feminine in tone. It pointed out that the man appeared to have a lot of cash and asked whether it would really hurt to let him put something in an empty unit for one night. You'll come get it by seven? Cody asked. Seven? Yes, I swear. I just need somewhere to keep this thing while I get a little sleep. What is it? asked Cody. Oh, it's just a... It's a painting. A really valuable painting, though. Got it? That's all I'm going to say about it since I assume we're being recorded. Good point, Cody thought. Into the intercom, he said. Sit tight. Let me come to you. The driver watched him approach with a wary look on his clean face. He wore a black pea coat and a small gray wool cap. So how much is it going to be? The driver asked. Let me see it, Cody responded. He pointed toward the truck's bed, where he assumed the alleged painting would be. No, that's not part of the deal, the driver said. I'll pay whatever you ask, but I won't answer any more questions, okay? I think that's fair. I'm assuming we're doing this deal under the table. Cody got the message. He took a few seconds to think, then decided to test the man to see just how much he could extract from their little deal. A thousand dollars, he said. The driver exclaimed, A thousand? Come on, man. You, I mean... He looked down at the envelope full of cash in his lap, then looked back up with a sour expression and a curt nod. Fine, you got yourself a deal. Now would you open this gate? Cash first, Cody replied. The man took a minority of the cash out of the envelope, then handed it to him. Cody counted it, then keyed in his code and opened the gate. Drive to number 34. Someone moved out of there yesterday, he said. He didn't think anyone would have moved into the vacant unit so soon, so it was likely still unlocked. He followed the truck on foot to the first row of storage units. The driver backed the tailgate up to the door, almost until his trailer hitch touched the handle. Then he got out and walked straight up to Cody. All right, thanks. That's all I need. I've got my own lock I'll put on it. Cody stood awkwardly, unsure of what to do or say now. He'd never taken part in anything so unethical before. He briefly considered handing the money back and telling the guy he'd changed his mind, but he considered the relief a thousand dollars would give him. At the very least, it would put him much closer to his goal of saving up one semester's worth of tuition. So, instead of insisting on further assurances, he turned his back and returned to the security office. He watched the man unload the painting and an easel on the monitors. The large canvas was covered by a cream-colored sheet, once it was stashed inside number 34, the man did indeed secure the unit with his own padlock and leave the premises. Cody wished for a chance to remind him to return before 7 o'clock when his shift would end. As long as nothing else happened that night and the guy showed up before Cody's relief, there wouldn't be any reason for anyone to review the footage of him accepting the bribe, which was essentially what the $1,000 payment amounted to. The footage would automatically expire in 24 hours. If he could just last that long without getting caught, he would be one grand closer to a better life. Just after midnight, Cody prepared for his first patrol. He was allowed to use the company golf cart, which meant it would only take him 10 minutes or so to cover the entire property, but he still brought a Diet Coke and a baggie of honey-roasted peanuts with him anyway. Anything to make the solitary patrol less boring. In packing these treats, he neglected to stash his newfound wealth anywhere safe, instead leaving it laying on the desk beside his chair. In a funny way, driving the golf cart made Cody feel less alone. Maybe it could be explained by something as simple as the headlights or the sound of the motor. He liked to play around with the cart, test its limits. In the long straightaway at the very back of the property in front of the boat shed, he'd managed to top the cart out at 14 miles per hour. 
That doesn't sound like much until you're sitting in a windowless golf cart with no seatbelt. Cody chose one of three patrol patterns at random each time he went out in order to prevent anyone from memorizing his movements. This time, he chose the route which took him around the outside first and past the boat shed before weaving in and out of the five main rows. He completed the outer patrol without issue, but when he passed the boats, he glanced from side to side, searching for someone to blame for the tingling on the back of his neck. He killed the motor and sat in silence, listening for any sign of someone he could not see. Nothing had arisen to strike his suspicion, but all the same, he felt someone or something nearby. He glanced up at a camera mounted on one of the light poles at the end of the boat shed, wondering if the camera's eye was all he was sensing, and quickly decided it must be. Not one for superstition, Cody started the golf cart up again. An ill-defined noise broke the stillness, cutting above the grumbling golf cart. Cody let off the gas to bring the volume down and listen, but did not stop this time. He felt abnormally uneasy out there in the dark, alone, and wanted to finish so he could lock himself in the office again. Maybe, he thought, his paranoia was his own fault for taking the bribe and letting the unidentified stranger stash his painting in Unit 34. The potential consequences of getting caught were starting to make him itch under the skin. He would lose his job most certainly, and possibly be forced to hand over the cash as well. Beyond the humiliation attached to both of these losses, he would definitely not receive a letter of recommendation from Brick Security or Riverside Storage, and would have to explain to any future employers why he was let go and how he ended up working at wherever he would end up. After nearly a full minute passed without another noise, Cody chided himself for being hypersensitive and turned the cart down the first row of storage units. The buildings were all eggshell colored with red doors that looked black at night until you got close. Cody could easily see all the way down the rows, but he always cruised past each unit anyway to make sure every padlock was still attached and undamaged. 38, 37... 36, 35, 34. Cody slowed the golf cart as he passed it, taking a moment to examine the stranger's padlock. He was sure the man who paid him $1,000 under the table to use the unit would have secured it properly, but still wanted to be sure. Cody could imagine the nightmare scenario of the man returning later that morning and discovering his precious painting stolen. Finding the lock properly secured, Cody pressed the delicate gas pedal down again. No sooner had the cart's motor whirred to its cruising pitch than something banged against the door of Unit 34. Cody slammed the brakes and jumped off the cart. He didn't know which side of the door the sound came from, but he did not see anyone else standing in the row behind him, so it must have come from inside. For defense, Brick Security only supplied him with a can of pepper spray and a heavy flashlight. As he stood in front of Unit 34, uselessly shining his flashlight on its red door, a hammering fist once more pounded against the inside three times. Cody's throat seemed to fold in on itself, choking him, blocking his startled shout from escaping. When his airway finally opened again, he called out, Who's there? and waited for a response. He felt like he was shrinking as he stood there, expecting another round of bangs or to get jumped at any second. The thought of calling the police crossed his mind, but if he called them, he would have to file a report. Riverside might be curious why the action had all happened around a unit which was supposed to be empty. A quick review of the security cameras would show his misdeeds, and he would lose his job and the thousand dollars. He rapped lightly on the door and said, If somebody's trapped in there, say something. I'm a security guard. I can help you. He turned his head to listen, holding his ear mere inches from the door. The loudest banging yet rattled the steel right next to his head, causing his ear to ring. He stumbled back, 
barely holding back a cry of pain. Okay, I hear you, he yelled. Sit tight, I'll get you out of there. What had he gotten himself into? If he was about to free some poor victim of the mysterious man, he would certainly need to involve the police. Maybe his heroism would overshadow the rest of what he'd done that night? Unlikely. But maybe the company would let him keep his job to quell any bad press if they tried to fire him. Or would he be considered complicit for allowing the man to lock his victim inside number 34 in the first place? He didn't even know the guy's name and had not bothered to read his license plate. Maybe one of the cameras caught it, but in the dark? Not likely. That made Cody the only identifiable person involved, even if accidentally, in the crime. But still, what was he to do? Leave another human being trapped inside the storage unit? His new best-case scenario became the person wanting nothing to do with the police and leaving voluntarily without making a fuss. Praying for this outcome, Cody retrieved the bolt cutters from the toolbox mounted on the back of the golf cart. He cut the padlock with ease and, preparing himself to jump out of the way if the prisoner came running out at him, tossed open the steel door. No one ran out. No one moved or made any noise at all. Cody raised his heavy flashlight, illuminating the inside of Unit 34. It shone like a spotlight on the single object inside the unit, and fortunately, it was not a human being. The only item inside was the covered easel. Cody could see the edges of the canvas outlined beneath the sheet. Hello? He called out, confused. His ear was still ringing, so he knew he had not mistaken a sound coming from another unit. He stepped inside number 34, shining his light into every corner. He circled the painting, wondering if, although it seemed impossible, someone was hiding behind the easel. The painting was roughly three feet tall and two feet wide. The easel held it three feet above the ground, and the sheet covering it barely touched the floor. He knew he would be able to see anyone crouched behind it, but he checked anyway. As he circled the painting, a low groan came from above his head. He shone his light upward. Had someone hidden on top of the door when it went up? They would have had to move with lightning speed. With Cody watching, the door broke free of its track and crashed to the ground, trapping him inside. He ran to it, knelt, and tried to raise it up with the flashlight still in his right hand. His left hand alone could not even slip beneath the heavy door. Cody had to set the flashlight down and try again. It rolled away, clacking against the wall, and flickered twice before going dark. Cody slammed his back against the door, unable to see anything in the pitch darkness. Panting, nearly hyperventilating, he crawled over the ground in search of his light. His pulse throbbed in the side of his neck. His head and heart pounded in time with each other. He reached into his pocket for his phone, but realized it must have fallen out in the golf cart seat as it was prone to do thanks to the wide pockets on his uniform pants. He could still hear the golf cart's motor faintly rumbling outside. He decided to give up on finding the flashlight and focus on lifting the door. Cody managed to squeeze the fingers of both hands under the door, but before he could lift it, he suddenly felt heat on his back. The unit filled with a dull orange firelight. Terrified, Cody turned to face its source. The sheet covering the easel was a blaze, burning outward from the painting itself. As the fabric burned away, producing noxious smoke which billowed throughout the unit, flames ate through it. The smoke began choking Cody, even down near the floor where he re-engaged in his struggle with the door. Take me away from him, a female voice screamed. Cody's heart skipped. He spun around, falling back against the door again. By now the flames rising from the painting had consumed the entire sheet but they still flickered and danced alive on the canvas which seemed entirely unharmed by them. 
They rose high on each side, forming a V where they met at the bottom. In the void between these crooked pillars of fire, a haunting visage glistened. Her irises glowed red in the fire's glow. Her lips also matched the flames, her hair, the smoke. Her face appeared delicate in its features, yet indestructible in its aura. She was beautiful. She was horrible. She was terrifying. Cody squeezed his eyes shut and held his breath against the smoke's burning. He told himself what he had seen was impossible, yet when he opened his eyes once more, there she was, staring at him from the canvas between the two burning pillars. He will destroy me. Take me away, she shrieked. I don't know what's happening, Cody cried back. She repeated, He will destroy me. Without collecting his flashlight, Cody lifted the door enough to slip under it and pressed it up with one arm as he passed through it. He heard a shrill scream after the door slammed down. He scrambled to his feet and ran to the golf cart, wondering if he should be driving anything at all as he slammed the cart into drive and sped toward the security office. What was happening to his mind? He felt like he'd been drugged. Could the man who rented 34 have coded his cash with LSD or something? Cody had heard of things like that happening before. He'd heard a rumor once that Charles Manson kept a Bible in his cell, of which every page had been soaked in acid so he could tear off a piece and eat it whenever he chose. He felt extremely wary of calling the police, but he worried an ambulance may be necessary if his head didn't start to clear soon. Back at the office, he parked the cart and ran to the door, hurriedly unlocking it, then locking it again behind himself. He fell into his chair and gazed up at the monitors. Unit 34 appeared no different than its neighbors. No smoke billowed out, nor did any flames seem to glow around the door's edges. Everything Cody had perceived, it seemed, had been in his head. This was as comforting as it was terrifying. A light thump behind him made him spin in his chair. He saw nothing at first, but caught motion in the lower corner of his eye half a second before a second thump. He looked down. There, on the floor behind him, lay the envelope of money he had accepted from the stranger. The first thump had been the envelope drifting off of his desk, probably in the wake of his chair swiveling around. Beside it lay an identical envelope, equally full. Cody had no idea where it had come from or how it could have possibly gotten there. Before his eyes, the second envelope flipped upward, pushed over by a copy of itself sprouting beneath it. These new signs of his insanity induced a curious experience for Cody. Propagating envelopes were just as crazy as a flaming painting that refused to burn or an oil-based woman screaming at him. But they made it far more difficult to dismiss the fantastical and flee from it. Cody leaned forward and plucked the original envelope and money off the floor. He stuffed it safely into his backpack, as he should have done before leaving the office. As he performed this brief action, a third duplicate sprouted from the second envelope, and a fourth began to grow from the first. Soon they would be reproducing exponentially, each one stuffed with a thousand dollars. Enough to cover half of Cody's first semester already lay at his feet. In case he was somehow not tripping on acid or totally mad, he tried to snatch one of the duplicates and stuff it in his backpack as well. But as soon as his fingers reached the magic cache, each one vanished in flashes of fire. Cody shot out of his chair, but by the time his eyes landed on the fire extinguisher locked behind breakable glass by the front door, the bills had already been consumed and the smoke had nearly dissipated. The miracle was over and left a charred taste in the air. It was the taste of temptation. Cody thought he heard a distant voice and his eyes went to Unit 34 on the monitor again. All appeared well but to be sure, he opened the front door a crack and listened. 
through the night, he heard her shrieking. Her voice, muffled by the steel door, completed the message Cody had thought she was trying to send. The woman wanted him to help her escape, and she was willing to pay. Taking all of his belongings in his backpack with him because he did not know if he would be returning to the office, ever, Cody got back in the golf cart and returned to Unit 34. This time he shut the cart off when he got out to keep it quiet outside. He knocked firmly, then stepped back and waited. Six seconds later, his knock was echoed back to him. He squirmed. Was this really worth the money? Well, yes, if the money continued to duplicate as he had witnessed. He could pay for his education, housing, and transportation as long as he needed. Hell, if there was no limit to how much he could get, he might not even need to waste time on college. He could save some, invest the rest, and spend his life doing whatever he wanted to do whenever he wanted to do it. Maybe I'll help you, he said through the door. But how do I know this is real? Behind him, Cody's backpack slumped off the seat of the golf cart. He cautiously approached it, wishing he had his flashlight. When he opened the backpack, three envelopes of cash spilled out. Inside, He saw more envelopes had been shoved into every available space. All right, I'm in, he shouted to the woman. He zipped up the backpack and swung it over his shoulder, suddenly unwilling to part with it. He stepped toward the door, hoisted it up, and stood with it raised above his head as moonbeams lit up the unamused face of the painted woman. Cody said, I'm going to take you away from here but I want to leave now so we can get far away before anyone notices. If you have more to tell me, wait until we get away. And I want more money. I want a million, no, ten million dollars. And I want your word that you won't do anything to me. I still don't understand what you are. He stopped talking and stared into the woman's red eyes. For someone portrayed being burned alive, she looked so unbothered. For the first time, the art of the painting captured Cody's attention. He wondered if his initial perception of the woman being burned might be incorrect. Was she really the one doing the burning? Setting fire to an innocent life? He stepped inside and picked up his flashlight. With the sheet burned, Cody did not know how to cover the painting. It seemed wrong It seemed dangerous, in a way, to carry her out unmasked. It felt like carrying a loaded gun with the safety off. However, he reminded himself of how easily the woman with the gray hair and red eyes had torched the sheet and told himself any covering he placed over her would only be an illusion of safety. True safety, he felt, he was choosing to abandon by involving himself with her. But with great risk, comes great reward, right? Fortunately, her canvas was not extraordinarily heavy. It weighed maybe less than a pound, certainly less than two. Abandoning the easel, Cody took her out of Unit 34 and propped her up on the golf cart seat beside him. Driving her to the gate, he plotted his next move. He considered texting his boss that he'd gotten sick and needed to go home right away. But he thought better of this, since he knew he'd been recorded the entire night. That was a problem he would need to face no matter what. He would obviously be fired, but he also worried the company might go after him legally for negligence. He felt certain he must have signed some document during the hiring process making him liable if he abandoned his post. He would just have to cross his fingers and hope that nothing else happened during the vacant night shift and Brick Security and Riverside would simply let him disappear into the sunset, so to speak. Sunrise, in his case. He parked the golf cart, made sure the security office was still locked, it was the least he could do, then carried the painting around the gate. There was no parking lot on Riverside property, so Cody and the other guards, those who didn't simply take the bus, always parked in a nearby lot at the industrial park across the street. 
During the day, the industrial park was a lively place, crawling with men and women, wandering between buildings, chatting with one another, or walking with downturned eyes. Working people, doing what they were meant to do there. At night, after all the buildings shut down and everyone went home, the parking lot became a cold, dark desert, a lawless land. While working overnights, Cody frequently noticed red and blue lights flashing from there. To his dismay, when Cody walked up the sidewalk and turned toward his parked car, he saw two other cars parked in stalls across from his that had not been there when he had arrived at 1055. Both had parked perfectly between two dim lights in the darkest possible stalls, so Cody did not notice at first that two men were standing outside of the further car, one at each window. He walked diagonally toward his own car as quietly as he could, hiding his badge behind the painting. It felt wrong to use her in such a way, but necessary. One of the men, the one on the driver's side, looked up and noticed him. Their eyes met for only a flash of a second. Cody turned away quickly, trying to communicate that he did not mean to get involved, that he would mind his own business. But it was too late to skate by unaccosted. Hey you, the man called across the parking lot, his voice deep and rough. Cody kept moving. The man called out again. Hey you, stop. Cody kept his eyes trained ahead at his own car, but then he heard the unmistakable clacking of a pistol slide and the click of the hammer locking back and looked up. Yeah, that's what I thought, the man said. His partner had turned around now and both started walking toward him. The first man was holding a large handgun canted slightly to the left. If he'd been a random observer, Cody might have chuckled at this cocky display, but staring down the black hole at the end of the barrel, the tilt made it no less terrifying. You want money? Cody asked, searching for a clean escape. And besides, money was no issue for him. He could toss the guy a cool grand with no skin off his own back. Money's good, the unarmed second replied. How much you got? Put the gun down and I'll show you, Cody answered, immediately regretting the authoritative tone he'd adopted. He hadn't even noticed until then how unreasonably powerful the money already made him feel. The armed man replied, Nah, I gotta make sure you don't pull something else out of that bag. He waved the gun at Cody's backpack. Cody swallowed. He raised his free hand slowly, showing he meant no harm. He cautiously set the canvas down, propping the painted side against his leg. He had not yet turned the woman's face out toward the criminals, fearing they might recognize the artwork as something which might be more valuable than whatever cash Cody had on him. Slowly now, the unarmed man warned as Cody slipped his backpack off his shoulder. But before it touched the ground, the other man started yelling. What's that badge, man? You some kind of cop? Stand back up. Stand up. Okay, okay, Cody yelled back. Leaving his backpack on the ground, he rose with both hands in the air, the painting still leaning against his right thigh. I'm just a security guard from across the street, okay? I'm just trying to get home. Across the street, huh? The man with the gun said. He stepped closer to Cody, leaning in to examine his badge. He asked, Ain't that the storage complex with all the rich people's stuff? Why are you leaving in the middle of the night, huh? Now his eyes dropped to the canvas propped against Cody's leg. He reached down to take it, but Cody, without thinking, grabbed his wrist. Terror gripped him back. The criminal looked up, meeting Cody's fearful eyes with his own, full of unbridled anger. Before Cody noticed him move, the man pistol-whipped him across the nose. He fell hard on the pavement, landing almost flat on his back. Something in his side jabbed him with pain, and he knew with near certainty he had cracked a rib. Look in his bag, the man with the gun ordered his partner as he stooped to catch the painting before it hit the ground. The second man rifled through Cody's belongings, then removed a single envelope full of cash. That's it, he said. That's all that's here, really. 
Oh good, Cody thought. She hid the rest from them. She is on my side after all. What is that, a few hundred? The armed man asked. It's a th- thousand dollars, Cody said, wincing. It hurt his rib to speak, and blood ran into his mouth from his nose. A thousand bucks, huh? But how about this? The man asked, pointing his pistol at the woman behind the fire. Oh, I see, said the other man, pocketing the envelope and dropping the backpack. He said he's a guard over there at the storage place, right? But look at him, calling it quits in the middle of the night. He's running off with something he thinks will get him something good. Aren't you, Ren, a cop? I'm not a cop, Cody sputtered. Looks like you never will be either, the second man laughed. To his partner, he said, Come on, man, let's get out of here. Nah, the first man replied. He felt an urge to do something he had never done before. All his years of burglaries and robberies, running drugs, bookkeeping, he had never harmed another person beyond a black eye or a bruised shoulder before. Pistol whipping the helpless security guard had felt pretty good, but a faint voice was urging him to try taking it further. This voice, coming from somewhere deep in his head, sounded strangely like a woman. Aloud, he said, This guy's gonna turn us in. No, I swear, Cody promised. I won't tell anyone. Besides, it's dark, I can barely see your faces, and there's no way I can read your license plate. Even if I did tell, I don't buy it, said the man with the gun. Cody said, no, it's true. I just want that painting back. He couldn't help himself. Take the money, take my car for all I care. I just need that painting. Oh, damn, it must be really valuable, said the second man. Cody stammered, no, it's not, it's just... The first man nodded to the second, who nodded back and he raised the gun to Cody's head. The voice in his head whispered, End this, and take me away. And that is just what he did. Around four in the morning, Mark Fryer, head of security at Riverside Storage, got a call from the police. His overnight guard, had been found dead from a gunshot wound through the eye in the parking lot across from the storage complex. He arrived 30 minutes later to cover the remainder of the overnight shift and answer questions from the police about Cody. With them, Mark reviewed the footage from that night and discovered the disheartening truth that Cody had not only accepted an under-the-table payment against company policy, but was killed in the process of stealing the very item which he had accepted the payment to protect. The painting he stole was nowhere to be found. Around six, while it was still dark outside, the black pickup truck returned. Its driver was visibly distressed when he saw the police tape across the street and when Mark met him at the gate instead of Cody. Mark tried to ask him about the painting, but the man could not be consoled. He kept whimpering about the evil that's out there now and about how he had failed. Mark recommended that the man go across the street and speak with the officers at the crime scene. Maybe they would take his report and help him locate his stolen painting. But the man backed his truck away from the gate and drove off into the pale sunrise. Later that morning, a new customer arrived looking for a unit. She was directed to the most recent empty unit, number 34, but she refused it because it smelled so strongly of smoke she claimed she couldn't breathe inside it. Before taking her to another unit, the attendant on duty removed the empty easel which had been left behind. After the customer was shown to a unit she found satisfactory, the attendant threw the easel in the dumpster. She left Unit 34 open to air out, although when her shift ended at 5 that evening, the unit still smelled like smoke. The men responsible for Cody Nestor's tragic death have yet to be found, and the painting they stole from him has not been seen since.
you made it out. Congratulations. If you enjoyed the story, please rate, like, review, or subscribe. For ad-free episodes and bonus Into the Woods episodes, become a patron with the link in the description. You can also support the show by buying merch. That link is also in the description below. To stay up to date, follow me on Instagram at The Warning Woods. If you feel ready, meet me here next week for another journey into the Warning Woods. Thank you for listening.